On this episode of Andy's Auto Sport TV, we're going to teach you how to tune carburetors, and we're very fortunate to be able to show you on a car called The Thing, owned and operated and built by legendary custom car builder, Gene Winfield. Okay, now we're going to talk about tuning a carburetor as we said. Now there are some key components that you need in order to be able to do this. One is you need a good vacuum gauge, very important. You also need a timing light. These are the two things that are going to make uh, tuning this carburetor a whole lot easier. Now your engine may not look like this. This is actually a flathead engine. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But carburetors are carburetors and this is what you need to tune it. Gene, let's talk a little bit about uh, the thing for just a second before we get to tuning it. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of this car and of this engine. Well, I first built this car in 1948-49 uh, and I ran it and ran it at Bonneville and El Mirage and all around. And it was basically the same body, the same frame, everything had a different nose. But uh, this is a flathead engine. This happens to be a 51 Merck flathead. It was built by Yosemite Machine in Modesto. Okay. Uh, Joe over there did a fabulous job, and he dynoed this engine at 249 horsepower. Okay. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but we're very happy with that for a flathead. Okay. Now, as we said, this is a flathead engine, and you may be wondering, uh, is this going to be relevant to me? Of course, carburetors are carburetors, so it doesn't make any difference whether it's on a flathead or on a, a 900 horsepower uh, NASCAR engine. It doesn't really make any difference. They all operate the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to tune this. Now, we had some fuel delivery delivery problems with this car, as we said, so we're going to straighten that out here on the dyno and show you exactly how to tune these carburetors. Okay, now when you're tuning your carburetor, you want to start with the basics. What you want to do is you want to make sure you have good fuel delivery. We know we have decent fuel delivery, but what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that our fuel pressures are set correctly and then our timing is set correctly. That is exactly where you start with tuning a carburetor, and that needs to be consistent. You may have to adjust that several times as you're going through tuning the carburetor, but that's where you start. Gene, let's go ahead and fire it up and uh, get, the, uh, get the fuel pressure going. Clear. Okay, now if you've got an electric fuel pump, you can actually just turn the fuel pump on and check the fuel pressures. Now, when we fired it up just a second ago, the fuel pressure was high, so we're actually going to go ahead and lower the fuel pressure. Now, on a carbureted engine, anywhere between uh, 6 and 9 pounds of fuel pressure is fine. I'm going to set this one around 7 is where I would like to get it and kind of keep it in a, in a good spot. That'll keep from blowing the needles off the seats. Now, with the new needle and seats that they have in the new carburetors, it's not such a big problem. But uh, if you have an older Holley carburetor that, does, that has some of the older floats and things like that, about 9 pounds is about the limit, and you don't really want to push it any further than that. Gene, go ahead and hit that fuel pump. Okay, shut it off. Okay, again. Okay, that's good, thank you. Okay, now if you are uh, setting up a fuel system for the first time, uh, you may or may not have a fuel pressure regulator. Depending on which fuel pump you buy, they are preset at a specific uh, pressure. However, this one has a real high performance pump in there that will actually go up to about 18 pounds, 15, 18 pounds of pressure. So that needs to have a fuel pressure regulator on there in order to get that pressure where you want it. Uh, a lot of, like I say, a lot of pumps actually have the fuel pressure regulator built into it and it'll be set at a specific point. But you still want to put a gauge on to make sure that the fuel pressures are doing exactly what they're supposed to. Okay, now that we've got our fuel pressure set correctly, we're going to go ahead into the idle adjustment screws. Now, keep in mind that, uh, now this is actually a Demon carburetor, not a Holley, but it's styled after the Holley carburetor and they, and they actually uh, adjust the same. Now, this has four corner idling. Keep in mind 
that every one of these circuits work together. Uh, the, the idle circuit and the power enrichment circuit, they all work together. So having the, the idle set correctly makes a difference on the rest of the carburetor as well. So what we're going to do is, this is where the vacuum gauge comes into play. Now we've already made sure our timing was set correctly. We've got our fuel pressures where we want. Those are the two foundations that you want to make sure you have set perfectly. And now you can go on to the idle adjustment. Gene, let's go ahead and start it up. All right. Now what we're going to want here is we're going to want to get the maximum vacuum that we possibly can with the engine at idle and that's how we're going to adjust our idle adjustment screws. Clear? Once you get your fuel pressure set, then you're going to want to set the float. This is real important that you do this after you set the fuel pressure to its desired level. Okay, now what we've done here is we have set our carburetor up to idle. Now, ideally what you want is you want the maximum vacuum that you can possibly get so you have good signal on the boosters. Now, the boosters are what actually the air goes through and actually emulsifies the air to go into the carburetor and it gives it a better atomization of that fuel. Now, how this car was set up is it actually has an, a, they think it's an idle adjustment screw and it's this little screw right here. And what it does, is it basically just holds the throttle blades open just a little bit. Now, that's fine, but when you do that, you're actually taking out the transition slot and making it almost um, a non-factor and, and not, doesn't really help you in, in that transition from the idle circuit to when it gets into the power valve. What that does is that increases the booster signal to the uh, emulsifier tubes in the metering block, and that allows a good transition until uh, for, for better signal to send more fuel through the boosters. When you have that throttle blade open a little bit, you kind of lose that. So what, ideally what you want is you want to be able to uh, take this all the way down to where the throttle blades are completely closed. And once the throttle blades are completely closed, now you're actually using the idle circuit for what it was intended for, and that is to make the car idle. So what we've done here is I went and I adjusted this to where it was maximum vacuum. Now it was sitting here idling at about 11 inches of vacuum. Once I readjusted the carburetor, the vacuum went up to 15 inches. As soon as it did that, now all of a sudden I'm idling at 1400 RPM. So I take the idle back down, I get the, the, uh, the vacuum gauge goes back down to about 12, which is still an inch more vacuum than what it had before, so it's pulling harder on the boosters. I go back through and I adjust the carburetor again, I get it back up to 15 inches of vacuum, then I'm able to take our idle screw down again. Now I have the throttle blades completely closed, which is exactly what's supposed to be, and I'm still pulling 14 inches of vacuum, which is excellent. So that's why you need the vacuum gauge. I've got it curb idled set where we wanted it. So here's the process in a short. Make sure you have your fuel, set, fuel pressure set correctly. Then you set your timing and make sure it's set correctly. And you know exactly where you want your RPM set on your engine for its idle. If you have a hot rod automatic, you, want, you have a curb idle where you want to make sure that it will idle in gear. So that might be 800 RPM, whatever. So you set it that way. Now, after you're done with that, now you go ahead and set your idle. And then you'll have to go through this two or three times before the vacuum doesn't change. Now, I went through it three times. And the third time I went through, nothing changed. So I knew I was exactly where I wanted to be. Now we can go on to dyno tuning and seeing exactly where our carburetor is. And now we'll set our main jets.
All right, so we got the thing off the dyno. Now everything went really well. Uh, this car was actually tuned on the dyno before we got it, but it was not in a real world setting. So the, the we, engine was tuned on the dyno. Yeah, the yeah, exactly. Right. The engine was tuned on the dyno, and uh, we so we didn't get a real world setting of it in the car. So now that we got it in the car, we got the idle set, we got the idle mixture done correctly, and all that stuff. So now it's ready to go to Bonneville on the dyno. This car made 249 horsepower to the rear tires and 270 foot-pounds of torque. Now that is with a 1951 flathead, and it also, on the dyno, we just spun the rollers at 149 miles an hour. The record in this class is 141. Gene, I think that record is, uh, is in jeopardy now. <laughs> I hope so. It sounds wonderful. I'm very, very happy with you and I'm happy with that engine. Absolutely. All right, now that's going to get us our basics of our carburetor tuning 101 basically so uh, we're really glad and we're real excited to see how you do at Bonneville. Thank you so much Bill and I'm ready to go. We hope you've learned something today and we'll see you on another episode of Andy's Auto Sport TV.